Hi, welcome. I'm Claire Graves, Executive Director of the Webby Awards, coming to you from our New York City office. It's the first time we've been back since March. Uh, I want to say welcome. We're so excited for you to join us today. This year marks the 25th Annual Webby Awards and we're really excited about this hallmark year, uh, which also happens to coincide with a year of turbulence around the world, which has challenged us, like I'm sure it has many of you, to rethink and reshape everything that we do. Over the last seven months, the internet has become our lifeline, the thing that has kept us connected and enabled us to support and uplift each other through this, through this time. There's also, of course, been rapid acceleration of, of innovation across the globe, which for a team constantly focused on digital transformation is actually super exciting to us. We've spent the last few months researching, documenting and studying the impact of the pandemic on society and the internet. And with our partners at Slack, YouGov and WP Engine, we've created a series called Over at Tomorrow, which focuses on how the global pandemic created an indispensable internet and ignited the urgency to build a better future. As part of the program, we conducted a survey of 3000 consumers all over the United States. And I wanted to share a couple of the results that really stood out to us. 92% of our respondents do not believe that the world will fully go back to the way it was before the pandemic. And 75% of people want at least some things about society to permanently change. We think that people are ready for a better future. And to that end, we're thrilled to kick off our five part event series with a conversation focused on what's on all of our minds right now, politics, activism, and advocacy. And we'll be talking to two phenomenal leaders in this space. I'm gonna kick off first talking to Crooked Media's political director, Shaniqua McClendon. And then after what I'm sure will be a really exciting conversation, our CEO, David Michelle Davies, is going to talk to Rashad Robinson, who's president of Colour of Change, about the extensive work that they're doing to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in the United States. And now I'm so excited to welcome Shaniqua McClendon to the screen. Hi, Shanique. I have your bio that I wanted to read. I hope it's not too embarrassing for you to do it in front of you. I will, I will just not listen. <laughs> Shaniqua has worked in politics for over a decade and currently serves as political director for Crooked Media, home to the popular podcast Pod Save America, and one of my personal favourite Webby winners from this past year, This Land. In this role, Shaniqua led the creation of their voter engagement program, Vote Save America, and volunteer engagement program, Adopt a State. Prior to Crooked Media, Shaniqua began her career as a White House intern for President Barack Obama. She then went on to Capitol Hill serving as a policy advisor to Senator Kay R. Hagan and legislative director to Con Con Congresswoman Alma S. Adams, where she spearheaded the creation of the first ever congressional bipartisan HBCU caucus. Shaniqua, welcome. We're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to join you today. We're really huge fans of Crooked Media, the Webby Awards, and particularly the work that you do to motivate people to participate in democracy. The election is, of course, on everyone's minds. It's two weeks away. And over the last year, you and your team have been doing an incredible amount of work. Vote Save America has registered nearly 60,000 voters and verified the registration of 340,000 voters and raised nearly $40 million for candidates, voter protection, local grassroots organisations. I was hoping that you might talk us through some of the work that you've been doing to give people an understanding of the breadth of that work. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, when I got hired, um, it's funny, uh, Favreau was like, I never thought we would have to hire someone for this position. Uh, but I think they realized they had this huge audience and uh, this audience was looking for something to do. A big reason that the company was founded was to one, talk about politics in a different way, but not only focus on what was wrong, but also tell people what they could do to fix a lot of these problems. And 
uh, the team I work on, we're a small team, but we get a lot done. We knew, um, we knew that this year was going to be really important. In 2018, we were focused on flipping the house and um, I think we had you know, a big impact on the successes that happened then. Um, but we knew this year would look very different, which is why we were really thoughtful about what we wanted to, um, the programs that we wanted to stand up. And so I think we'll get into this later, but um, you know, creating adopt a state so that people anywhere in the country could get involved in the states that would be most impactful on um, not just flipping the White House, but actually flipping uh, the Senate and uh, state legislatures around the country who will play an important role in, in gerrymandering. And thing that we've done, uh, Forget Mitch, that has, you know, we, it has gone beyond anything we expected, but I think it just has demonstrated how eager people have been to, to do something, to put their energy somewhere. Um, so, you know, and more than anything, uh, I talk about this a lot, the coronavirus pandemic, I think, has really made people pay attention to the role that government plays in their everyday lives. Um, so it's really just helped bolster the work that we do and have a lot of people who are eager um, to, to participate in what we have going on. Yeah, it's, that's exactly what we've been focused on at the moment as well, is how the pandemic has reframed so many people's thinking. Um, the adopt state program, if I recall correctly, launched about a month into the pandemic. And yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Was it a is, it a is it about a month or? A it's just funny. We were supposed to launch it on March uh, 14th, I think. And then March 13th is when we all got sent home. So we ended up having to push it back some. So one of the things that has really blown me away about the campaign is that it is perfectly designed for pandemic life. Everybody can participate from home. They don't need to go anywhere and they can do it from anywhere in the United States. Did you have to re-strategize and pivot what you were planning or was that the campaign that you had already been organizing? Yeah, um, you know, I think a lot of people think that we were just, you know, really smart and stood this program up really quickly. But in all honesty, uh, we had come up with the idea in 2019, uh, not because we knew a pandemic would be here, but because we knew that most of our audience, um, in 2018, you could pretty much live anywhere and be close to a competitive house race. But in 2020, when we were focused on the Senate and the White House, there are a handful of states that are going to determine what happens um, in the White House and, and the Senate. So we know where most of our audience lives and it's in pretty blue places. Uh, so we wanted to come up with a program that would allow them to you know, channel their enthusiasm and their energy into the places where it would have the greatest impact. So uh, that was the initial uh, point. That was the initial um, way that we thought about the program, but it was supposed to end with us around this time saying, hey, whatever state you adopted, now we want you to go there and help do the work in person. And so we did have to change um, that part of the program. Um, but, uh, you know, we pushed pause on it because there were a lot of organizations we were working with, but they had to transition uh, what they were going to do in light of the pandemic. So, you know, we chatted with them, understood what they were doing. And then in June, we, we launched it at the end of May, actually, um, and we kicked it off with uh, four trainings. And I don't know if there's ever been a training with this many people, but our first training had 16,000 people participate um, in our organizing training. And uh, over the course of June, we had four and we pretty much kept attendance um, in the same place. But it was, you know, I was afraid that people would not be interested in, in doing as much work not because they didn't want to, but because the pandemic had just taken so much of their time. Um, but we were completely surprised. And I think it makes sense now that people were eager to participate. And you have how many people have signed up to do it and are active? Oh, yeah. So we've had 300,000 people sign up to um, adopt a state. And so um, it doesn't break down evenly, but that's across all six states. Uh, but we have uh, between 40 and 50,000 people that show up almost every week to participate. Uh, and then we have a smaller group um, of about 4,000 volunteers who go above and beyond. Um, and, you know, they do the things we ask, but then they also ask us what more can they do? And they have been uh, wonderful. And, you know, um, as we now are two weeks out, I think we're going to see a lot more people who are just looking for something to do, you know, people who maybe 
are not used to volunteering for you know six months before an election are looking to tap in now. So I think we're going to start seeing those numbers actually increase as we uh, get closer and closer to the election or so to I election day since the election has started already. So, so can people join now and help contribute now? Yeah, um, you know, if you still want to adopt the state, we have two more uh, weekly emails that will go out, one this Thursday and one next Thursday. So you can go to votesaveamerica.com slash adopt. Uh, but we also, if you sign up for the Vote Save America uh, uh, email list, we're gonna start putting opportunities on there as well. And we actually just launched a Vote Save America volunteer page. So if you don't want to sign up for an email list because you know you have too many emails, uh, you can also find the most important opportunities and the most impactful ways to, to get involved on that page as well. Uh, it's votesaveamerica.com slash volunteer. Awesome. Crooked media is, um, a, feels like a really new media company. And it has unbelievable fans. Um, you've previously said that you joined Crooked because of its name recognition to and to increase civic in engagement. What's the importance of this, especially across the podcasting community? And why do you think it's been so effective for Crooked? Yeah, you know, um, I was in graduate school right before uh, I took this job and I went to graduate school thinking I would pivot out of politics and then Donald Trump won. <laughs> and so I figured, okay, I'm, I, there's nothing else I can do um, that will keep me sane unless it's working uh, in the political space. Uh, but the reason I wanted to work at a company that had uh, influence, if you will, um, was because there were so many you know, voter campaigns out there and it just felt like we needed something more. And a lot of them, I mean, all of these campaigns do a lot of great work. Um, I think the big difference between us and them is that we um, are in a unique position where we have a media component to, um, uh, to our organization. So we're able to mobilize our audience pretty quickly. Um, but we also are, you know, really open about who we support. Uh, we don't, you know, we're not nonpartisan. And I understand why a lot of organizations have to be um, again, because we have this media company, uh, we're not going out to, you know, ask for donations the way a C3 or C4 might have to do. Um, so we're able to just kind of talk about the candidates, break it, break things down pretty, pretty clearly. Um, but I think the reason we've been able to bring all those people in is because our, um, our hosts, uh, particularly on Pod Save America, they have insight into the way government works. They've worked in government. They understand the politics of what might seem like a simple decision, but is actually going to trigger a whole lot of other things that don't make it uh, such a simple process. So I think people keep uh, coming back for that. And also, you know, Vote Save America, when we launched it in 2018, it was a really unique place. You could find information on, um, you know, voter registration de deadlines. Um, if you could register same day, if you could register online, or if you had to do it in person. We also um, have information now that we had last uh, last cycle, but is more important now, but information about voting by mail. And we filled in all those blanks. Um, we also have a build your own ballot tool where you can type in your address and pull up your ballot, see all the candidates and ballot initiatives that are on your ballot. And we also gave people um, a place to volunteer. So you could type in your zip code and find something near you. Uh, and now this year we're, you know, kind of saying, hey, you know, nudging people to where, um, to where they should volunteer. But I think the reason we've been so successful specifically as um, a, a podcast produ production company is, you know, at least for me, when I listen to podcasts, I feel like I'm in a conversation with my friends, even though, you know, they can't hear me talking, but, you know, I feel like I'm there. And I think that builds a lot of trust and credibility with your audience. And so when we ask people to make a donation or to sign up for a volunteer shift, it feels like it's coming from someone that they know and, um, you know, they're more inclined to do it. Yeah, totally. This is a question that we've been thinking about and we're sure that lots of other people have been thinking about when they've been listening to God Save America or Love It or Leave It over the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Have you and the team started to strategize about what Crooked Media is going to focus on after the election? What's next for Crooked Media if Joe Biden wins? Yeah, so the outcome of the election will have a dramatic impact on um, 
on what we're going to do after the election. Um, but I think either way, we're going to continue to hold whoever's in the White House accountable. Um, you know, that looks very different when you have someone that you just pretty much disagree with on everything. Uh, and when you have someone who's willing to listen to the things that you want to see done. Um, and so we still have to have a lot of these um, conversations, but generally we will still be working to advance progressive causes and progressive candidates by mobilizing our audience to um, contribute and to uh, volunteer and just help elevate progressive messages. Uh, you know, what I'm hopeful for us to be able to do is really to go into places um, and states and, and just areas and help start building the if infrastructure that's necessary to actually win elections, um, you know, into the future. I think that Crooked can also, and will continue to grow in this space. I think we've done a great job so far, but really take up some space on the left um, to have uh, to kind of match what you see on the right with talk radio and, and Fox News. Um, I don't want to put us in the same bucket as them because, you know, we we don't come up with conspiracy theories and we're not just going to be the mouthpiece for um, a Democrat just because they're in the just because they're a Democrat, but we do want to offer a place where people can come and understand what's happening in the progressive space and again get the tools that they need to have an impact on the things that they want to see change. It will hopefully be really exciting to see how Crooked changes. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, the company, I think it's obvious that it came out, like a lot of organizations, it's spun out of uh, Donald Trump being elected. Uh, but I think we're going to be here for a while. Um, I think our audience has shown us that they have an appetite um, to affect change. And hopefully I'm not, you know, uh, jinxing this in any way. But I think that Donald Trump's election uh, and, you know, not just that, but we've seen even, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, people show up to protest police violence. I think that there is this spirit that is running through a lot more people to be a lot more engaged in what's happening around them. And I don't, I think whether or not Donald Trump is reelected, that spirit will stay with them. And I think we'll be able to benefit from it, um, you know, in electoral politics, but just like our social politics generally. So I have one more question, but I think we have a couple of questions from the audience that we wanted to ask you. Sure. Let me just find them. Okay. You touched on this for Crooked Media, but how should voters be thinking, preparing for the next four years, regardless of the election outcome? Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, depending on who wins, um, we're going to have to hold them accountable. Um, but I think people should start paying a lot more attention to down ballot, um, not just elections, but people while they're in office. So often we get focused on federal elections and don't pay attention to a lot of the local races that are happening in our backyards. You know, I live here in California and I'm not sure. I mean, the race is getting a lot of attention. Um, but there is, uh, you know, an LA County district attorney's race that's happening right now. And there's two Democrats running. And so, you know, that might seem strange, like, oh, then both of them are probably good candidates. But I think it's if, if people are paying attention to, you know, the candidates platforms, who's endorsing them, they'll see that there is a sentiment here for who is the best candidate uh, for holding police accountable for police violence, um, and just generally uh, how they approach criminal justice uh, reform. Um, and so paying more attention to these local leaders, I think is really important. And, you know, even state legislatures, there are so many, I always use this example in Virginia, in 2017, there was one race that ended up being tied. And to determine who the winner was, they pulled a name out of a hat. Uh, and the Republican ended up winning, but it wasn't just as simple as the Republican won. Because that Republican won, uh, Democrats did not gain the majority in the state assembly. So there was a lot at stake. And, you know, if, if one more person had voted, it wouldn't have ended up in a tie. So I think paying attention there, because our local and state leaders, they are the ones who are just having a tremendous impact on our everyday lives. Um, and we need to keep our eyes on them, too. We're running out of time, so I have one more question, um, and then we'll hand over to David and Michelle. I imagine that you are just waiting for the results of the elections to really analyse what you've learned from what you have been doing, but we wanted to know 
what have you learned or what have you implemented or embraced over the last eight months that will be, become a part of the organization moving forward? Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty much what I was just saying about people's uh, willingness to get involved and engaged. Uh, if you would have told me five years ago, well, maybe I'll say six years ago, um, that people would be willing to step up and respond to so many of the issues and problems that have um, affected our country, I would have been very skeptical. You know, it's been hard for me to get friends to participate in some of this stuff, but now everyone I know is really eager to be engaged and, and involved. So I think we're going to continue to um, harness that energy and you know, it won't always be a presidential election that we're trying to harness that energy behind. It might be a local issue um, in a state. It might be a ballot initiative and in trying to get one on the ballot in a state that, for instance, needs to pass Medicaid expansion. So I think the biggest thing I've learned is that if you tell people what the problem is and how they can fix it, they will step up and do the work that's necessary. Let's keep them stepping up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Shaniqua. We are so excited that you joined us today. Oh, thank um, you for having me. We're looking forward to seeing what happens in two weeks and where Crooked goes from there. Yeah. Thanks, Shaniqua. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to our CEO, David Michelle Davies, who's going to talk to Rashad Robinson, the president of Colour of Change. But before I do pass the mic, I um, just wanted to remind everybody that our early entry deadline is coming up next week. Um, it's on Friday, the 30th of October. And we really encourage everybody who is making work that they're proud of and wants to enter the Webby Awards to do it by that date because you can take advantage of early entry pricing. Of course, you can enter at webbyawards.com. Uh, so on that note, thank you. And I'm gonna pass over to David Michelle. Thank you, Claire. And thanks everybody for joining us. That was a great conversation. Um, really interesting. I think we'll, we'll be a good uh, foundation for hopefully what Rashad and I are going to talk about. Um, so really quickly, before we introduce Rashad, let me tell you a bit about him. He is the president of Color of Change, which is a leading racial justice organization driven by more than 7 million members, a lot of members, um, who are building power for Black community. Uh, let's go ahead and welcome Rashad. Hey, David. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you know, I know that I know that at Color of Change, um, you know, part of the mission is to bring about systemic change in parts of the world and in systems that infect black that affect black people, like technology and Washington and Wall Street and city government and you know, up and down the line there. But can you tell me, in your own words, a bit about the work that, that you do and what your mission is? Absolutely. So, you know, Color of Change was founded um, a little over 15 years ago in the aftermath of a flood, which was Hurricane Katrina, that was caused by bad decision makers and turned into a life altering disaster by bad decision makers. Black folks were literally on their roofs begging for the government to do something and were left to die. And the thing about Katrina was that it illustrated things that people already knew in many ways, like COVID geographic segregation, generational poverty, the impacts of what we've done to our planet, the ways in which underinvestment and structural racism undergirds all those things. But at the heart of it, no one was nervous about disappointing black people, government, corporations, and media. And when institutions are not nervous about disappointing your community, it doesn't matter what kind of research report you have that illustrates all the facts and figures, you need power. And so part of the theory of change of color of change is that we translate the presence, the visibility, the awareness of issues that impact our community. Sometimes we raise presence through our work as well, but we channel that presence into power, power to change the rules with a deep understanding that people don't experience issues, even though we may work on criminal justice or work on economic justice. People don't experience, wake up in the morning and saying, oh, it's the criminal justice system. People experience life. Right. And the forces that hold us back are deeply interrelated. So a racist criminal justice system requires a racist media culture to keep it alive, to keep the demands, to sustain it and make people believe that it's protecting them. Political inequality goes hand in hand with economic inequality. And so part of how we uh, sort of approach our work is 
every single day working to make our members more powerful in the world. And if we can make black folks and our allies of every race powerful, make decision makers nervous about disappointing us, then we can uh, work towards a more human and a less hostile world for black people. But when black people win, uh, the history of this country has proven that everyone wins. And so the progress for all of us uh, moves forward at the same time. So give me an example, like how do you, how do you, tr or what have you done and how do you translate something like a big concept like criminal justice reform into something that's actionable? How do you bring that issue to people in a way that they understand and motivates them and allows you to take action to actually start to change that, that overall problem? It's a great question. So we've developed this strategy of respond, build, pivot and scale. So respond to moments that are happening in the world. Sometimes it is uh, police violence. Sometimes it is issues that expose themselves in the criminal justice system or that partners on the ground may expose. And what we try to do in that moment is give people something strategic to do. And so you'll never hear, uh, uh, you'll never get a petition from Color of Change that says, tell Mitch McConnell to stand up for affirmative action. Because we know no matter how many people sign that petition, Mitch McConnell is not standing up for affirmative action. And so we don't just send people petitions because it makes us feel good. We're constantly looking at what is the strategic lever by getting enough people to engage that we can actually put pressure on a system that is designed to listen to us. So sometimes we have to go to corporations. Sometimes we have to find the right target locally. And as it relates to, for instance, criminal justice, you know, as we were seeing police officers both um, uh, not be held accountable at the same time watching mass incarceration continue to rise, we recognize that the district attorneys played a really key role in that. And so instead of consistently, you know, asking our members to go to a lot of different places each time something happened, we started to build power around district attorneys. And there are 2,400 district attorneys all around the country. 90% of district attorneys, about 90% are white, over well over 80% run unopposed. And we started back in 20, late 2015, early 2016 to start building a program around that. And so we launched the platform winningjustice.org. And winningjustice.org is the only searchable database of the 2,400 prosecutors in the country. And so we've now worked to place not just pressure on prosecutors' offices and places where we are working on our path, but day in and day out, our, our organization, Color of Change, not just the PAC, is working to um, push those district attorneys to actually implement new policies. We are working to um, uh, hold them accountable in ways they've never been held accountable. We are working to get very clear victories, everything from how uh, police are held accountable to how uh, marijuana and drugs is treated, to how sentencing is treated, to how bail is treated. Very clear results, but taking a, a kind of political position that people weren't really paying much attention to. And then kind of, in that, helping everyday people understand what's at stake and then channel that energy through strategic campaigns to make clear demands. On winningjustice.org, you'll find uh, six different demands that we've developed with the movement with a deep recognition because there are 2,400 DA races that we're not gonna be able to engage in all those places that color of change. And so we've opened it up. So other folks around the country, there are places where um, allied organizations who may not be racial justice organizations, but care about this work can take on some of those races and places where black folks or brown folks don't represent the policy. But we, we pair that policy and, and advocacy work with culture change work in Hollywood, where we're in the writer's rooms of basically every crime procedural room, working to push Hollywood to uh, tell the stories more accurately of the criminal justice system, of the role of prosecutors, of the role of police. So when I talk about changing the rules, we are talking about both the written rules of policy by holding those in power accountable, but we are also talking about the unwritten rules of culture by holding those folks that get to tell the stories of this moment, tell the stories of our culture, we hold them accountable as well. And in both situations, we make institutions accountable to black communities. Because when our communities, once again, are powerful, institutions will be nervous about how they deal with us. That's really, really impressive. Um, you, you talked a bit about culture there, and um, I wanna touch on that. You know, I think that a lot of people here in the US and globally are newer to these conversations. And 
um, for some of them, they, and they entered into this discussion, this broader discussion around racial justice, you know, digitally, it wasn't necessarily at a protest or at someone's house as part of a conversation, but it was watching um, the events unfold and seeing them largely on their computer and being at home, but then wanting to do something. What does it mean and how do you think about um, what it means to be an advocate for people from home? And, and how, do they, how do they do that? How do you think about impacting culture with people who are at home? Well, here's the thing. It is such an honor to be able to, in moments of crisis, in moments of pain, um, in moments of struggle, to be uh, part of giving people something to do giving people the strategic uh, next step uh, that they can take, the, the lifeline. And, and in times of peril, whether it is because of the sort of um, recognition of racial injustice that is happening for a lot of people, or whether it is just the day-to-day -day aspects of how the coronavirus has impacted our lives, people are looking for very clear things to do. And sometimes activism, being able to translate our caring into something to do is the is the lifeline, is the thing that can um, open up new possibilities. So it is absolutely an honor to be able to do that. And we take that very seriously. We take it seriously, not just in terms of what we ask people to do, but where we make our bets. How do we sort of um, engage? There are so many issues that we can take on every day. And so part of it is really doing deep listening through our data team, through um, our campaigns team, of really identifying what are the things that are impacting people the most. And then really looking at sort of the strategic levers that if we hit them, we can actually make more possible. And then constantly having a deep recognition of the larger problems of corporate consolidated power, of a democracy um, that was not written and designed for us to succeed, of an economy that was built on black servitude. If we understand all those other things too, we won't be fooled by things that are charitable solutions to structural problems. And what I mean by that is um, sometimes when crisis hits, people wanna jump in and make things happen. I mean, going back to that Katrina story, right? Part of even the foundational story of color of change is people were giving to the Red Cross instead of working for systemic change. And it's not that you don't want to help people in those moments, but if you're only helping people and not working to change the conditions, then you're not working from a justice mindset. So we're not simply looking for people to send water bottles to Flint without actually dealing with why the pipes were not clean. We don't simply want uh, service days at inner city schools if we're not fighting long-term to change public education and deal with all of the ways in which a system is not broken, but it's operating the way it's designed. We don't want people to simply work on reentry if we are not fighting to end mass incarceration. We don't want just know your rights trainings for young black kids if we are not dealing with police violence and police misconduct and downsizing policing and investing in the things that we know keep communities whole. This is part of also how we sort of take our charge is how do we take the sort of pain, outrage, passion, and joy, uh, black joy. How do we take all of those things and channel it into something that will make people's lives better? And I mean, I think a lot of been, there's been also been a lot of discussion of, and sort of touching on sort of what you're talking about, the water bottles, which is having people participate in a way that's meaningful and not necessarily performative. And a lot of people want to participate and they, a lot of, I mean, they don't want to be performative. They want to be you know, they want their action to be meaningful and not just signaling. How do you think about that? And how do you organize action in a way that it can have that type of impact that people are looking for? So, you know, that's a really good point. So I want to say like, if people need water bottles, we want to get them water bottles. We want to get them clean water, right? Like that's not, but it's, but it's sometimes we, we stop there because we've come up with this idea that that's, that that in and of itself yeah. We can go back to doing what we were doing before. Part of this is even how we talk about the story. And this is not just opponents to what we want. It's even our own communities, right? If we start up from a framework of calling Black communities vulnerable, right? Vulnerability is a personal trait. You know, I may be vulnerable if I go on social media and see an ex that's too happy with their life. I need to work on myself. That is personal vulnerability. But when you talk about communities as vulnerable, you're talking about them as weak, right? And Black communities have been targeted 
exploited, put in harm's way. That's not vulnerability. And it's not about fixing black communities and black families. It's about fixing those systems. We do this a lot when we talk about communities that have been oppressed. And so we will say black folks are less likely to get loans from the bank instead of banks are less likely to give loans to black people. We will say women, women of color, women of all races are less likely to get senior level positions in tech instead of tech companies exclude women from senior level positions. And why this is important, because it could seem like I'm just playing games with language, but what I'm really talking about is when we talk about systems in passive language instead of active language, we spend our time trying to fix the people that have been harmed instead of fixing those systems. And so in the sort of example of women in tech, we spend a lot of time with uh, mentorship and pipeline programs rather than fixing racism and misogyny inside of the industry. On the banking example, we will spend a lot of time putting people through uh, financial literacy programs instead of actually dealing with banks, which from their very foundation have either excluded, targeted, or exploited Black communities. Part of this is how do we get to a framework of actually understanding the problems that we're facing so that we can face them in ways that get us to solving them, so that we can put forward the right solutions that are not about fixing people who are oppressed and targeted and exploited, but demanding that the systems that have targeted and exploited them um, are dismantled and changed. The language is really important though, right? I mean, because ultimately that's, that's you have to be super aware of it when you're talking about it to make sure you don't fall into the trap that you're just discussing and essentially continue the problem. Well, it's not an accident that that's the trap, right? Traps are, are by design, they are manufactured, right? So it's, you're so right that this um, idea is a trap because if you have a system and structure that almost relies, right, on it to continue the same way so that the same winners continue to win and the same losers just by default have to continue to lose, then you um, then these traps are much more understandable that the language that we use, the, the kind of caring um, and charity, which um, is kind of built on some nobility instead of um, actually questioning why in the richest country in the world we have to have charity to feed people and we don't have systems and structures where people pay their fair share and that as a result um, we have people have the things that they need. Um, this um, is about how do we build a more a justice uh, filled society uh, where all of us have opportunities um, to succeed and so you know, going back to this idea that people don't experience issues, they experience life, then now we can think about how this sort of impacts each area of our work from how we approach a criminal justice system that is built on profiteers, right? And you have all sorts of systems that rely on the criminal justice system to be in place from people who make money off of phone calls in the prisons to people who supply the beds and the foods to private prisons themselves, um, to small towns whose economies are built on the idea that more people will be locked up, right? And so even trying to dismantle this, right, it's not a hearts and minds game alone because this is not simply about changing hearts and minds. This is about reorganizing a system which actually has profit margins built on suffering and pain. And you could go through each area. And this is why, um, you know, as we approach these areas, we try to approach them at getting at the root. It's been, um, you know, part of um, a lot of the work that's animated us through this kind of moment of, cri of corona crisis, as we both had to deal with all of the ways in which the economy, right, has been um, geared and, that, and built to lead us to this crisis, but also all of the solutions or so many of the solutions that could potentially get us out from the ways in which the small business loans that went through big banks never got to black and brown communities through the technology that we are on right now that was built without black and brown people. And as a result um, was built in ways that doesn't allow for our full participation the same way that other communities have been able to participate. Let's talk, I mean, we, you're talking about tech there. Let's talk about tech for a little bit. I know Color of Change recently organized a pretty big boycott of Facebook, encouraging advertisers to pull successful 
um, boycott, I would say, uh, encouraging advertisers to pull their advertising. Tell us about that and why you did that. So, you know, our work on Facebook has been, you, heard, you saw that deep breathe because it's like, it's been like five, six years of like, back and forth with Facebook. It started back, you know, in 2014, 2015, when Facebook was um, allowing the surveillance um, of Black Lives Matter activists and the doxing of Black Lives Matter activists. And a lot of that, actually you can find a lot of that in my very good friend's book, um, uh, The Purpose of Power, Alicia Garza, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. Her book came out today. So I'm just yeah. doing a, a plug for my uh, sister, Alicia. Um, but I, I say all that to say that um, we were sort of facing down Facebook um, um, in those early days. And then what we, um, so it was more and more ways in which the sort of systems in that institution um, were designed only for profit and growth at the expense of safety, integrity, and security. And so what ended up happening was we watched as a woman by the name of Corrine Gaines in Baltimore was in the inter interaction with police, had her Facebook live on. Facebook got a call from law enforcement without any rules in place. They turned off her Facebook live. Corrine Gaines ends up dead, no video. And so now we are in these back and forths, but it really did come to a head after we had asked and demanded that uh, Facebook do a civil rights audit and they agreed and um, auditing all their policies and practices and they stalled. And we worked with Senator Cory Booker and he um, asked uh, Mark Zuckerberg at the first hearing that um, Zuckerberg went before Congress to about the civil rights audit. And then we got some more speed when, when Mark um, uh, decided that he was going to, you know, say yes, they were going to move forward with it. And then in 2018, we found out from the New York Times that Facebook had hired a PR firm to attack us. Um, I got a call from the New York Times right after the story posted asking us for comment and I had no idea what they were talking about, but they were, they had a PR firm, even while they were saying they were going to work on civil rights, they were going to do this audit, that they had hired this firm to discredit us. This leads to the next couple of years up until now of a lot of back and forth with Facebook. Um, some of that we actually worked and got a lot of policies in place. We brought Sheryl Sandberg to Atlanta to meet with actors activists and really hear on the ground what was happening. We spent time going back and forth in detail around policies. And then they don't actually enforce the policies that we get in place. Because the incentive structure at Facebook is not designed for them to enforce those policies when they run up against profit and growth. And so part of what we ended up coming to um, at the 1st of July and beyond was a recognition that we couldn't keep doing the same things over and over again and getting different and with and expect different results. And the part of what we, ne what we know about monopolies, about consolidated power, is that we weren't going to cause enough pain to the bottom line of Facebook, but hopefully through bringing over a thousand um, corporations who no one would call socialist justice warriors. Maybe those guys at Ben and Jerry's are social justice warriors. They're kind of they're kind of on it. But it, most folks were not social justice warriors. With a group of social justice organizations like the NAACP and Free Press and ADL and other groups, bringing those groups together, right in this conversation where we were demanding more from Facebook, will hopefully be a message to Congress that we cannot have um, big platforms, a platform like Facebook, which has over 2.6 billion users. Let me say that again, 2.6 billion users. That's more followers than Christianity. That has one person controlling 60% of the shares and is chairperson and CEO. And they talk about themselves as a public square. We've got to be able to have systems that actually hold them accountable. The same way that there are rules for the folks that deliver our meat to our grocery stores and the people who inspect um, our safety belts in, um, in production lines, we actually need companies that are full of people that call themselves engineers to actually have rules for what they build and consequences for how it hurts people. I mean, so I'm sure when you had those meetings with the various executives at Facebook, I would imagine that you probably all felt like they were well-meaning, good intention people, or like that they came to the conversation with good intentions, I hope anyway. Um, and then, and I, you hear this with, not, not just with Facebook, but other tech companies too. 
and people meet with them, they express the issues, there's, there's good discussion, and then it, it just, it falls down. Do you get a sense of, is it falling down on a sort of like a human level and a passion for doing the work? Or is it, is it falling down just in a, it's not the way the place works and it is very hard to change the way it works from just talking to them? Or have you gotten a sense of where, where it breaks down from wanting to do better and not succeeding at it? Yeah. And so, you know, Maybe you're naive. I don't know. Yeah, but. No, no, you're not naive at all. I mean, these are questions to ask, right? And, I sit with Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg and, you know, they donate money to causes that I care about. Um, you know, I, I, this is not about personal um, yeah. anger at them. Um, here's, here is the thing. There are a lot of times where folks can be very well-meaning, but they don't want to change anything that they're doing to end the inequality that they're either benefiting from or that they're advancing. Yeah. And so they may we may, they may not be uh, the sort of caricatures from the sort of movies that we see of villains, but that doesn't make them any less responsible for the sort of pain that they're causing. Mark Zuckerberg is more nervous about disappointing Donald Trump than he is about black folks, about Jewish folks, about LGBT folks, about Muslim Americans, about uh, uh, Muslims around the world about, um, he is more nervous about the regulation because growth and profit is the long-term goal. And if growth and profit is the long-term goal, then you will constantly, you may care. He may actually care and he may actually like, but he's constantly trying to figure out ways to fix the problem without actually dealing with the business model, which is the problem. And if the business model is the problem, then you're going to constantly figure out, you know, COVID has been like tough on my like, uh, my exercise regimen, the gym's closed, like it's like, you know, like, and so, you know, I can find a lot of different ways to try to like, keep healthy that don't involve exercise. But at the end of the day, without exercise, like I am just fooling myself. And without structural change, they are just fooling themselves. And this is what we consistently come down to. This idea that they can fix the problem without making sort of the deep changes. Because at the end of the day, they have to run up against Donald Trump and regulation. And regulation would challenge growth and profits. And so that is what we're facing here. And so I do just want to invite people into this idea that it's not whether or not they're good people or not. Um, they're not running a soup kitchen. Yeah. Um, that's what I care about. Um, they are running a, a huge, the largest communications platform the world has ever seen. A hugely profitable corporation that wants to deliver profit quarter after quarter. And if you go into the room understanding that, then the choices you make strategically are not about whether or not I like these people or whether or not I dislike these people, which is just as important because we don't wanna make them caricatures. They're, they're real people. What we want to do is recognize that any person leading an institution that had this level of power without any oversight or rules would be susceptible to making the type of decisions that Mark Zuckerberg is making right now. And this is not about Mark Zuckerberg, even though at times we have to sort of channel energy and campaigns to focus on him. This is about a system and a structure which is designed to get the results that it's getting, which is um, tools that radicalize hate and send people down a rabbit hole of being um, more deeper and deeper, deeply violent systems which are designed to allow for voter suppression and misinformation to travel, um, systems which can violate civil rights laws, the sort of rules that we have won and fought for and the people before us have won and fought for. Like this is what we're sort of up against in so many ways. And for us, while we may not have what we need at the congressional level right now to, and the president in the White House to get the type of structural change, that is why we have to run these campaigns and face them down. But part of this is about raising attention for the larger public so that we can make the demands on our elected officials to do the things necessary so that the technology that, that has so much potential to bring us into the future, to connect us, to give us sort of more ways to advance and become better, 
doesn't drag us into a past, a past uh, where um, any of us who were oppressed, any of us who were marginalized, any of us who were attacked could be run up on in public space, uh, uh, a, a past where um, it doesn't matter if you have civil rights law because people, if you have enough power, if you're the sheriff, if you are an elected official, you can violate those laws and not be held accountable. This is what's at stake. And, and in so many ways, you know, even listening to some of the sort of uh, words and stories from Facebook employees to hear that like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg may have a philanth uh, philanthropic arm that is donating money to all sorts of causes that I actually believe in. And at the same time, he would, he knows he would be better off for himself and for Facebook with having a president in office that stands in direct opposition to the things he gives money to. And that's the game that capitalism can create. And we can't allow ourselves to be confused by any of it. Yeah, a couple audience questions, um, just to follow up on this. What are some really big things that either Facebook or other tech companies could do um, to really rectify the way their platforms uh, support misinformation and hate? So a couple of things. First, they could um, first they should be running all of their new policies and their new tools through a civil rights uh, through a civil rights screen. You know, we're sitting on Zoom right now, and you know, at the height of the early days of the pandemic, you know, people were Zoom bombing all of these events, and they're still doing it. But it was happening a lot. And I remember we launched a campaign, and I'm being in conversation with senior level folks at Zoom. They said. Well, we never imagined that people would want to interrupt someone's gathering. And I was like, that's probably because of who you had around the table when you built that, because you probably had a lot of folks that don't have experience with having their gatherings and their celebrations and their coming together. So first and foremost, they have to have people that understand civil rights. A lot of my conversations with Mark Zuckerberg, even about um, some of the posts like the Donald Trump looters and shooters post and some of these other posts sort of really exhibit a deep, uh, lack of understanding of civil rights, American history, and sort of uh, race relations. Um, you know, it's almost like I understand coding better than he understands those things, and I don't really understand coding. Um, and so I say that to say that that's one thing. A second thing is really how targeting marketing works on these platforms. And they've got to um, start reining that in in ways that may decrease their profit lines, but will actually allow for um, less of the sort of targeting and harassment. They've got to deal with Facebook groups and these sort of places where people are gathering and are allowed to sort of organize. I spent multiple years trying to convince Facebook that they could that they had to ban white nationalist groups. And if they banned white nationalist groups, they also didn't have to ban groups for women who were breastfeeding who didn't want men in those groups. Like it wasn't the same thing, but this was the sort of obtuse sort of aspect of the conversation that we were in because there was sort of no uh, moral rudder. The rudder was money and growth and profit. And so, um, and so all of that to say, like, those are a couple of things. Folks can go to Stop Hate for Profit, uh, the Stop Hate for Profit site, and they can see a list of the larger demands that the coalition has put together. And these demands really do um, center on a, a set of things that Facebook could do pretty immediately. They can also look up the uh, civil rights audit that Facebook commissioned themselves, that actually the final audit gave Facebook basically a failing grade, um, their own audit of civil rights. And that goes through a whole set of policies and practices. The trick with Facebook though, and I think that this is important, this is important in a lot of issues that face black people, a lot of racial justice issues. Like I use this example in, in the policing situation it's already illegal to kill unarmed black people. Whether or not it's enforced and people are held accountable is about power. And so Facebook actually has some policies on the books that we've helped them implement that somehow don't get enforced when it's Donald Trump or Donald Trump Jr. Um, violating them. And so the other thing I would say to that question is to enforce the rules fairly across the board. You know, I live uptown in New York City. I live a stone's throw away from Harlem and a stone's throw away from Columbia University, who's basically taken over Columbia. And oh, Columbia has taken over uh, 
uh, Harlem. And no one can tell me that there's not just as much drugs being done on Columbia University's campus as there is in Harlem, but we know who gets arrested, who gets charged, who gets, who gets um, brought into the system. And so we know that just because you have laws and rules doesn't mean they're gonna be implemented fairly. And part of why I talk about not just the written rules, but the unwritten rules is because building power to change all of the rules is how we get to more justice. I think that's a great place to, to wrap up, Rashad. Thank you so much. It's been a really great conversation and a very enlightening. Um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I want to thank all our guests, Shaniqua McClendon from Crooked Media, Rashad Robinson from Color of Change. Um, thanks to our executive director, my colleague, Claire Graves. Um, thanks to everyone who's joining us. I also, of course, want to thank our sponsors, uh, Slack, YouGov, and WP Engine for supporting this program. Uh, and invite everybody next week. We invite you to the second event in our series, Overwrite, How We Learn, where David Rogier, the CEO and founder of Masterclass, and Wendy Kopp, CEO and co-founder of Teach for All, will join us to consider what we've learned from 2020 and how it will shape the future of education and how we're all learning online these days. Um, you can RSVP at webbywords.com. Uh, it's next Wednesday, the 28th at 1230. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to have you. Um, Thank you all and stay well.